By white man's standards, Harold Ross is a pauper, but in his own world, he's wealthy beyond imagination. As a man of high degree, the Aranda elder is a custodian of Central Australian songs. Mr. Ross is the keeper of the story of Nulia, who in the dream time ran down from the nose of stone. The warrior in Twaluka pursued the animal and hurled his spear at it. From the mortally wounded dog, a man emerged. Again arrives in Alice, the locals give a cheer. They start when it comes a chugging through the gap. Brings in all the tourists and it brings the beer. In the center of Alice Springs, a rock embodies the streaming. It's part of a living culture, predating ancient Rome by 35,000 years. And this is the way Alice Springs, the town of missed opportunities, pays tribute to Noelia, the man dog. Give me a town situated in a scene by Namajira, a town like Alice is just the place. The type of tourists that's coming into this area now is from the overseas market. No matter where they go to, um, they expect uh, top quality, and I think that um, that's one of the reasons we do need a uh, stretch limousine service in Alice Springs. And so Alice Springs turns the marvellous into the mundane, traditions into tinsel. Give me a cluster of roofs that shine in the midday sun. A quiet hour on a veranda when my day's working. These days, the roofs that shine in the midday sun are on buildings that don't belong in the outbank. Just 22,000 people live in Alice Springs, yet everybody's heard of the place. It's the heart of the nation. It once stood for what was special about Australia. But development and progress became the buzzwords, and the heart is heading for a massive coronary. When my day's work is done, I might, like Dallas, I'll visit gay Paris. But when I settle down, it must be a town like Alice for me. Pine Gap is the most extreme example of the town's readiness to trade its future for dollars. The base, 19 kilometres outside Alice Springs, may still be a first strike nuclear target. It certainly was before the disintegration of the communist world when we talked to Dr Richard Lim. He was vice president to the ruling country Liberal Party and deputy mayor of Alice Springs. Dr. Lim estimated the town was earning $20 million a year from Pine Gap. That, in financial terms, means quite a significant um, level of bodily comforts for a lot of people in Alice Springs. And I believe because of that, some people are willing to take the risk that uh, Pine Gap may be a target. And, um, you know, and, and take the chances with their, um, their livelihood. Joint Defence Facility Pine Gap and in the blue, the United States Air Force In all your life you'll never ever see a sight as odd as our Henley on the top Brigada Day. Brigada Day, we'll see you there. Brigada Day, see you there tomorrow. The Henley on the top Brigada Day. Odd sights indeed. This is the American head of Pine Gap, Donald Kingsley, probably the most senior foreign spy in the country. We'll rent a camel out at Sally's. You can ride around the block. Oh, you're welcome here as long as you can stay. Take you to the outback to 
When the future became expendable, it's little wonder that the past was seen as worthless. As Alice races to catch up with the big time, Ted Egan's famous tunes become merely nostalgia. The angry lyrics of a Munda and Aboriginal rock band more closely reflect the agony of Alice Springs. So Alice will grow so fast, but the young days like hell. Because there was going to be a little bitty town, uh, real simple, but uh, it's uh, got a lot of nifty shops. Mm. Oh well, it was different from what we thought. The Alice Springs is more modern uh, than we have expected. We have expected uh, uh, a town which, uh, yes, like we know it from uh, America or somewhere else. Uh, every towns in the desert are not so modern like uh, Alice Springs. I believed uh, when we came we thought it would be a village, a small village. Ironically there's no need for many of the buildings for which this heritage has been sacrificed. There's now a massive surplus of office space. The 80s was the decade of the property developers and they savaged Alice Springs. Mike Gillam is a prize-winning photographer and campaigner for what he calls appropriate development. He's been one of the few to speak out as the bulldozers have levelled most of the old Alice. I'm not sure what the long-term future holds for Alice Springs, but certainly the immediate future is likely to be a continuation of the present, which is virtually no town planning, ad hocery on a grand scale, anything goes, Everything's for sale. Um, we already have a Hawaiian style motel with huts and swaying palm trees. We have a shopping mall which was transplanted from the Gold Coast. We can become the bad taste capital of Australia. And the title of founding fathers would have to go to the government planning authority. Its head, Jim Robertson, once described Mr. Gillam as vicious and reprehensible. Yeah. Mr. Robertson made the comment when Mr. Gillam wrote to the local newspaper defending the popular mayor of Alice Springs, Leslie Oldfield. She had been bumped off the planning authority after standing in the last territory election as an independent against a government member, Roger Vale. Mrs. Oldfield and a few older men have been campaigning for heritage preservation. But does the council have the powers it needs? We don't have control over town planning, building or anything like that. It's a Northern Territory government uh, responsibility, although council has four aldermen on the town planning authority. However, they're all there in their own right and they're not uh, obliged to take the uh, council position to those meetings. Uh, they speak on their own behalf and not necessarily always on the behalf of the community. This man, Les Farnham, helped shape the new look of the old Alice. Marin's news agency was one of the few original buildings left in the main street. Mr Farnham, contrary to explicit assurances to the National Trust, reduced Marin's to a pile of rubble. No one screamed louder than Roger Vale, now the Minister for Tourism. When the news agency was levelled, he was a backbencher of the ruling country Liberal Party, in power since the declaration of self-government in 1978. Mr Vale and his government had done nothing to preserve the character of the town. It wasn't until 1991 that the Territory Administration passed any form of heritage legislation. By and large, too late. In most cases, prosperity hasn't followed this heedless sacrifice. The Marin site was needed for the expansion of a motel. Six months after construction work had finished, the motel was put into receivership. The principal contractor lost three quarters of a million dollars. His company's in liquidation, as is the air conditioning contractor who is owed $130,000. The high-flying Mr. Farnham skipped town, eluding his creditors, his Melbourne-based lender, the Independent Order of Oddfellows, and the Victorian Fraud Squad. Some folks like a place that's sophisticated, or where the sea is nearer. The Territory Government itself primed the development hype in the late 70s and early 80s. 
Chief Minister Marshall Perrin was the Territory's treasurer in 1978, when Australia had only one casino. A storm of public protest broke out when the government announced that Alice Springs was in line to have the second. I was concerned about the problems it may bring, and um, I, I continued to be concerned really right up until after it was opened, but we were assured by the government at that time that there would be no problems. If there were, they would be appropriately addressed. We were also advised that there wouldn't be any poker machines in the casino, and um, I'm not a big gambler, but I, I felt that this wasn't necessary for Alice Springs. But in those heady days, nothing was stopping Mr Perrin. He told the town there was a need for a first-class hotel, along with a restaurant and convention centre. Federal Pacific head Greg Farrell boasted the project would cost $5 million and when completed would offer 250 permanent and 100 casual jobs. Opponents claimed the casino would be patronised mainly by locals and be of little benefit to the town's economy. At their Rest Point Casino in Hobart, Federal Pacific counted, 80% of gamblers were from out of town. Mr Perrin assured Alice Springs the casino would be of the highest standard and attract the international high rollers. He said there'd be no poker machines, although he declined to commit future ministers or governments on that issue. Well, today Mr Perrin leads the Territory Government. There are poker machines wall to wall. The gamblers are almost exclusively locals. The high rollers are staying away in droves. The hotel section of the casino has been closed for two years and the restaurant is now a bistro. The casino has declined to give information to this program, but the number of staff would seem to be more like 50 than 350. And police confirm that prostitutes are now openly working in the town, unlike before the casino was opened. I was concerned about the escort agencies, um, organised crime, uh, people, normal people living in the town becoming gambling addicted. Um, those sort of things were concerning me and the outcomes from them. People, families losing lots of money. It has happened in many cases. Uh, we have um, got the women's community house here now, which is used a lot by people who have suffered in these ways. Um, some Opponents say that's a lot of pain for little gain. Gaming tax paid by the casino has amounted to just over $2 million for the past five years. Among the very few conventions held there recently was that of Mr Perrin's own country Liberal Party. That isn't entirely surprising. While the Alice Springs Casino is the only one in Australia exempt from licence tax, it made a donation of $10,000 to the country Liberal Party in 1987. A town like Alice is just... Bill Ford, who now controls the casino, is also involved in the most spectacular private development disaster in Alice Springs, the Ford Plaza. This new heart of Alice Springs is to many a symbol of the woes that have befallen the town. So Alice don't grow so fast, let your young days ahead. Half the plaza's shops and offices, including some of its biggest, are empty. Seven of the remaining tenants are refusing to pay rent. The plaza was reportedly built for $23 million, yet the banks couldn't find a buyer for a quarter of that. A town like Alice is just the place for me. The Territory Government itself set the pace in development disasters, and since four-fifths of the Territory budget comes from Canberra, the Australian taxpayer is the silent partner. Eulara, the resort at Ayers Rock, was meant to be the tourism industry's flagship. It has turned out to be its Titanic. The resort's annual growth in visitor numbers has been just 13%, from 136,000 to 242,000 in six years. Low-budget tourists accounted for the bulk of this increase. Before Eulara, visitation to Ayers Rock was growing by 30% a year, more than double the new resort's performance. 
In those days, tourists were staying at four outback-style pubs run with negligible government subsidies. These motels were rich in character and provided basic comforts. But that style wasn't good enough for the then Chief Minister, Paul Everingham, father of the bigger and better philosophy in the Territory. Everingham wanted a new glitzy resort. He set up a string of supposedly private companies, which in fact were entirely guaranteed by the government to finance and own Ulara. This scheme removed the project from scrutiny by the Commonwealth Loans Council, although the taxpayer shouldered every bit of the financial burden. By mid-1991, Ulara owed $235 million and the debts were growing. In addition, the government had made up $56 million in operational deficits during the resort's first seven years. And that didn't include expenditure for staff housing, water, sewage, electricity and a range of other facilities. The costs for these were hidden in the budgets of several government departments. Additionally, the government-run Tourist Commission spent a good deal of its $17 million annual budget on promotion of Ulara. In November 1991, the government announced a restructuring of the finance and management arrangements. Ulara was euphorically pronounced the territory's newest town. That means a local government budget, the taxpayer again, will now pay for any remaining non-profitable infrastructure not already tucked away in the balance sheets of other territory departments. The government hopes this will clear the way to sell off the profitable elements of what it now calls the Ayers Rock Resort. A town like Alice is just the place for me. With my own piece of ground, the mountains around, that's where I'd be. Don't need While the government was desperately trying to sell the Jilara, the Western McDonald's were practically ignored as a tourist draw card. The magnificent ranges extend from the town's doorstep to some 200 kilometers west of Alice Springs. They have a history of 600 million years, were once higher than Mount Everest, and later became islands in an inland ocean. A large park straddling the ranges would boost visitor numbers by the government's own estimates from the present 100,000 a year to a quarter of a million by 1995. This park, without doubt, is Alice Springs' most important economic project. Intended to replace the present string of mini reserves, it was first discussed in the 70s. The government bought 400 square kilometres from pastoralists a few years ago, but the park still isn't a reality. The administration was allowed to procrastinate with impunity. The pressure group of the region's foremost industry, tourism, was thrashing the government with a feather duster. Libby Prell heads the Tourism Association. Has she been given a timetable for the park by the government? No, we haven't. Should compulsory acquisition of pastoral land be considered? We are working very, very closely with the Conservation Commission and supporting the Northern Territory Government in their moves, read the West Max Park, and as, are as keen as anybody to see, to see that completed, but are also very, very aware of the delicacy of that matter and the land acquisition from people who have had some of that land in their families for many, many years. Now, you know, that is a matter that has to be left to the Northern Territory Government. How much income would such a park generate? I think there has been a figure done in one of the studies, but um, no, I can't, I haven't got that in my head at the moment. The government's fumbling of the Western McDonald's Park plans became even more ludicrous. On the auspicious occasion of the opening of a bicycle track attended by almost the entire cabinet and hardly anyone else, Conservation Minister Mike Reid explained what he thought was the state of play. Uh, all I can say to you is that negotiations are continuing. They are at an advanced stage uh, in relation to some areas and the government's commitment is clear and strong. Um, if you encounter problems in the negotiations, would the government consider compulsory acquisition? Oh, that might be an option. Less than four hours later, Chief Minister Marshall Perrin declared that two cattle stations would be forced to surrender land. One of them, Nawatuma, is leased by a strong supporter of the park proposal. 
While Mr Reid was telling media that negotiations were going well, the fact was that the government hadn't even responded to a land offer made by Nawatuma. The cattle industry, normally cautious in its criticism of the government, could make no sense of Mr Perrin's expropriation announcement. Well, I was surprised when I heard that the Chief Minister said that there was going to be a compulsory acquisition of Nawatuma and Glen Helen because I understood that negotiations were proceeding quite satisfactorily. A town like Alice is just the place for me. As the exciting potential of the Rangers is finally being recognised, the futility of the development hype in the town is being drawn home. Bruce Deans was a victim of that hype. He was pushed into decisions he now regrets bitterly. Born and bred in the Alice, Mr. Deans owned a string of successful menswear stores. Now he's struggling to keep up repayments for an arcade, which cost him and his partner $1.6 million. What was the atmosphere in the town at the time? Oh, there was, there was development crazy. I mean, there was things, uh, developments popping up all over the place. There was uh, uh, things that I thought at the time were um, just uh, ludicrous for a town like Alice Springs. Well, I think they all, all the, the planners didn't have a feeling for the place. They uh, were just willy-nilly uh, and allowing investment to come in here and not thinking of the future of the town. Uh, what we've got now is that we've got uh, some, some disasters. Uh, in fact, what you, where we are at the moment, the northern end of this uh, mall, is, in my view, a, uh, a ghetto. At night, that ghetto often erupts into violence fueled by booze and the outcast status of sections of the black population. Oh, I think she got a little bit of stay with her boyfriend or husband or whatever it was, a bit of fight, that's it. I don't know what happened. She just ran into my shop. They break lots of windows on the road and everything else. Lots of disturbance in here, so it's no good. But what can you do? You just have to keep on going. Yes, it is. What happened? Who's cans this? Far from a place in the community to which their ancient culture entitles them, Aboriginal leaders have their hands full with a massive alcohol problem. There is a group of Aboriginal people here who are willing to help them and we're here to develop programs that will be applicable to Aboriginal people and will have a lot of, of our own culture in the programs. So that's, I think that's an important thing, to, especially with people that drink, because while people are drinking, they tend to forget all of those important part of being an Aboriginal and their language and the culture and that that they've left behind. Now they're gonna build a dam, cause the Todd River ran. The failure to appreciate the worth of these traditions has rarely been so blatant as in the bungling of flood control. Heavy rains can turn the normally dry Todd River into a torrent. Several people have been killed, most of them Aborigines. Many more have been injured in floods over the years. A dam in the desert seems ethically wrong. Just one more statement that we don't belong. No one advocates more loss of lives, but nobody paints a river that dies. Oh, we're living in the desert, but you never really guess it. And we'll have its heart and soul when the river's controlled. Shade cloth and air conditioning. Now we'll the government has talked about flood mitigation for more than a decade, although the not-so-hidden agenda was to build a recreation lake. The mentality that turned an outback town into a Gold Coast clone was getting to work at turning the desert into an aquatic playground. There are several ways to control the river, but the government is insisting on building a dam. That is the most expensive option, the most damaging to the environment, and it would destroy Aboriginal sacred sites. Aborigines vowed resistance. I will fight them. Uh, to the last, I guess uh, we'll take them into court, to high court, for the destruction of our land. That'll be one thing, and uh, the next thing is we'll block off these roads. We'll, we'll uh, uh, picket the roads, if you, that's what you call it. 
We'll block up the road and we'll get the media here. We'll get all sorts of coverage here. The government has spent a million dollars and scarred much of the site when Federal Aboriginal Affairs Minister Robert Tickner ordered work to stop. He stepped in when it became clear that mandatory consultations by the government with custodians of sacred sites were completely inadequate. Those foothills, those strong elements of the landscape, the mountains, the, the river, are also overlaid by an Aboriginal spiritual environment. We have a town which is crisscrossed in sacred sites. Instead of regarding those as an impediment to development and planning, we should be taking our cue from those features. We should be highlighting them. We should, we should be viewing those as exciting opportunities and directions to town planning. This is a point on which idealists and at least some leaders of local commerce are in agreement. Full of pioneers. Thomas Mueller has managed Sheraton hotels the world over. He says tourists here aren't getting what they've come for. Feel to it. They um, would like to see nature, uh, which they can't see in town at the moment, um, and uh, real outback uh, quality of life. They also, in my view, expect a lot more Aborigine culture to be seen and to be able to be seen. And they would like to experience the Aborigine culture uh, at close-up, if you will. Um, In like reality, to... however, such close contact is avoided carefully. White people do most of the talking about black culture. Now with this particular group of Aboriginal people, men who belong to section number one will always marry women in section two. In that case, the children will belong to section three. But it can go the other way. That means that women in Section 1 can marry men in Section 2. But when that happens, the children belong to four. A town like Alice is just the place for me With my own piece of ground the In the headlong rush towards progress, Alice Springs has violated even its own birthplace. Altunga, 120 kilometres to the east, was the place where white settlement began in Central Australia. Rubies and gold were discovered late last century. Hoping to escape the misery of the 1890s depression, diggers took the GAN train to Udnadatta. From there they walked or rode 600 kilometres to Altunga, crossing some of the world's most inhospitable country. They jumped from the frying pan into the fire. There were desperate water shortages, isolation, government bureaucracy. Worst of all, the mercilessly hard rock of the White Range refused to yield its treasure. Kate Holmes carried out archaeological work at Altanga for the past 14 years, tracing the history of pioneering families. The Kavanaghs, uh, the Shavas, uh, the uh, Webbs, who came up and then went on into the pastoral industry who may not have come to this place otherwise. Uh, it was one of the reasons for the development of, um, of an actual town at Alice Springs. It was then, na then named Stuart. Uh, so although always a very poor gold field, uh, it did have a, a great impact on the, development, the early development of Central Australia. Until recently, Altunga was a tourist boom waiting to happen. Enter the Adelaide-based mining company, White Range Gold. Uh, the department's very pleased with the proposed programs of both those mines. Um, at this stage, White Range looks like a four-year program, but of course they're looking for future reserves. So when mining started, proven reserves were expected to last just four years. Yet this was good enough for the Territory Government to wreak destruction on an historic site. Today, the Great Western Dig is the only one that isn't wiped out or surrounded by the scars of modern mining. By allowing the White Range mines to be destroyed, they've, they've 
they've destroyed the most interesting mining history of Altanga. The man who authorised the destruction of White Range is Territory Mines Minister Barry Coulter. Huge variations in estimates of gold reserves should have raised doubts about the soundness of the project from the beginning. The company's prospectus, admitting to be highly speculative, in 1987 estimated gold reserves to be 10 to 30 million grams. Mining received the green light in March 1989. The company's chairman, Keith Yates, had this to say in April 1990. We announced all reserves. We estimate that the sales revenue from the gold that we are likely to produce will be of the order of $60 million. That was about 3.8 million grams, little more than a tenth of the original estimate. In the Northern Territory, it's almost good enough for a developer or a miner or whoever to come along and say, my project's going to, going to give tremendous economic benefits to the country, um, lots of hype, and we just take their word for it. There's no actual evaluation of their statement. In, in the case of White Range, Altunga, what happened is uh, we decided, it seems to me, with, with undue haste and very little assessment, that the heritage sites there could be sacrificed for the return in gold. After only two years, the company, White Range Gold, was put into receivership and mining stopped soon after. The company will not disclose how much it owes to Alice Springs businesses. Meanwhile, White Range Gold hasn't paid a single cent in royalties. As a failed mine, the historic hill is a sad monument to the myopic development fantasies of the Territory Government. The shining metal has turned out to be elusive yet again, but this time also irretrievably buried in the rubble are Altunga's far more tangible riches. Only a fraction of the historic sites are left that could have attracted tourists from all over the world for centuries to come. Europeans would have the time uh, to come here, they would have enough time to, to, to explore the, the area. Uh, Alice Springs wouldn't have to be in a recession because they would have the, the money and the time to spend. This town has to have a central theme, be it Aborigine or be it early explorers, uh, frontier people. Um, we should go either way or both ways. I think... Uh, there are at least two visions of the future. Alice in Disneyland is one of them. What we're trying to do is provide a coordinated second generation development attraction where they can physically experience those things. So we walk through a wildlife area where the tourists are actually involved physically in the area rather than looking through a cage. They then go from the, the wildlife environment section of it to the, the Aboriginal component which will incorporate uh, direct Aboriginal involvement and have operating artists in residence. There'll be interactive activities with the tourists will have an opportunity to throw boomerangs, uh, really become a, an interactive participating part of the scheme. And then as a separate element again, and the, th the third in the progression will be the uh, historic township, the old, old Stuart town, really trying to Mr. Martin didn't reveal the proposed location for this brand new old town of Stewart. Sources say it may be close to the airport. In that case, tourists will snap all their photos without even setting foot in the real Alice Springs. The other vision belongs to people like Mike Gillum. I don't think progress is, is raping a distinctive piece of country and responding to, to it as though it was just a, a suburb of Sydney or Melbourne. I don't think that's progress. I think progress is protecting, highlighting and celebrating the unique qualities of this region. Perhaps it's too much to expect simple beauty to figure prominently in the planning process. I don't see why, why we shouldn't be attempting to make this the most beautiful town in the world if for no other reason that we live here.